Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to the MBK Leadership Forum. You're watching a public moment of a virtual conference hosted by the Obama Foundation's My Brother's Keeper Initiative and in partnership with the National League of Cities and Bloomberg Associates. As a reminder, the Obama Foundation's My Brother's Keeper Alliance is a nonpartisan, nonpolitical 501c3 organization. I'm your host, Senegal Alfred Mabry. I am a Obama Foundation My Brother's Keeper Alliance Advisory Council member. I'm also an alumni of the New York State team that developed the first statewide and state-funded My Brother's Keeper system in the nation. And it is my honor today to welcome all of you in your cities tuning around from across the world to the MBK Leadership Forum. This Leadership Forum was designed to convene cross-sector leaders in MBK communities across the world, helping to, best, helping to share best practices for supporting our boys, young, boys and young men of color, spotlight models that can be followed, and center racial equity as the core drive to transform communities and improve the lives of our boys and young men of color. I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host and partner who's out there breaking barriers and building dreams, Alejandro. I appreciate you, my brother. MBK family, I'm your co-host Alejandro Galiz Cervantes, and today's program will feature youth and community leaders on the front lines of social justice and community transformation, discussing the unprecedented activism and action that has taken place in the years since George Floyd's tragic murder, highlighting the effective models that are reimagining policing and public safety and encourage sustained engagement from diverse stakeholders to ensure lasting results. This is a space, a very special space for everyone who's doing their part to break barriers and build dreams. To ground us in that energy, open up your hearts to the spirited words of an individual who has been doing just that. Please welcome Chicago organizer, artist, founder, and executive director of Equity and Transformation, Richard Wallace, to kick off the program. Hello, family. It's good to see everyone. Um, and I'm here to do poetry, which I'm really excited about that opportunity because it's been a while since I've actually had a chance to practice. Um, I wrote this piece, it's called Black and COVID during the middle of the pandemic. And I wanna ground you all in where that is and where I am, and that is Chicago, Illinois. Um, and so I wrote this poem in the beginning of the pandemic. A lot transpired after that, you will see. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share it today with you. Oh, here he go again, being extra. I guess I'm tired of playing Tetris. Shape-shifting, spinning on my back so racism doesn't catch us. Poor Aubrey. During a pandemic that stole loved ones at arm's reach. Reminds me of I can't breathe. Lord, can we have a moment with you, please? We've been hanging from trees since we got here on the bottom of boats shackled to our elders as they rot there. If there was ever a moment to show yourself, it was right there. A hundred years later and we are right there as jail cells turn into electric chairs if COVID's there. The spook that sat by the door, heard plans of war, a war like no other where race was used to other, the able disabled others. Mothers shackled at birth gave birth to children in shackles from it, the trauma. Worn like armor, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a savage, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a monster, opposed to I'm a asylum seeker. My parents were taken from us. Don't tell me you didn't hear Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, or Laquan, that you didn't see Trayvon Martin murdered on that lawn. The list goes on and on and on and on. My grandmother told me stories about you, told me to never doubt you, so I don't. I'm praying that you ended, but I'll settle for some hope. Please show a sign, sign black and COVID. Thank you. Wow. Um, everyone, please show some love to Rich in the chat for those powerful words that I think capture the hope and the herald that this unprecedented year has brought on our communities. Our work at MBKA is about as President Obama says, narrowing the promise of our ideals, 
with the reality of our times. Our MBK communities are every day listening, striving, and refining their approach to supporting our communities of color across this country. Working with MBK at a state and national level, I'm blown away about how much you all are able to accomplish even in the wake of the crisis and the disproportionate impact of the pandemic and the police violence in communities of color. We know that to, for those who have been given and much, much more will be asked. So now is not the time for us to let up. I am confident that this generation of activists and policymakers and change makers will ensure the movement that began in the wake of the violence of 2020 will turn into justice and equity and opportunity for generations to come. With that, it is my sincere pleasure and honor to introduce the 44th president of the United States of America, Barack Obama, for a conversation with activists, organizers, change makers, and elected officials. The conversation will celebrate the unprecedented year of activism, spotlight the progress that has, that has been made, and help you transform the moment into a movement that will change lives and strengthen our communities for years to come. Welcome, Mr. President. Well, thank you so much, and, and thank you all for participating in this virtual forum, uh, this gathering, this convening. Uh, to, to deal with a, uh, an issue that, or a set of issues that uh, this country has been grappling with since its founding. And, uh, you know, I wish that I could see everybody in person. Um, uh, it reminds me that at the top, uh, I want to say that my hope is the next time uh, the MBK communities across the country convene, we can do it in person. That in part depends on uh, us making sure that all our communities, but particularly communities of color that have been disproportionately affected by COVID, uh, that we all get vaccinated. And so I don't want to start with a public health message, but uh, this is something that uh, is uh, deeply important to me. Uh, I've been going around the country uh, letting folks know that this vaccine is safe, it is effective, and our communities in particular uh, have to make sure that, uh, that we take advantage of something that, by the way, was developed in concert with, as opposed to just provided to uh, uh, communities of color. Uh, you have outstanding uh, doctors and health professionals uh, from the start who are involved in uh, getting the breakthroughs that are allowing us to uh, be safe and. Uh, be with our families once again, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, get rid of this the scourge of this disease. But uh, obviously, the the broader topic we're talking about here uh, doesn't involve just a single vaccine or a couple of shots. Uh, this is something that uh, requires all of us to dig deep and to uh, address in a way that uh, promises a better future for our kids and our grandkids. Uh, you know, I could not be prouder of the work that all of you have done. Uh, the, the genesis of My Brother's Keeper was uh, seven years ago in the aftermath of uh, the killing of Trayvon Martin uh, and the fact that uh, not only did this young man die senselessly, but uh, the criminal justice system revealed itself to be uh, inadequate in dealing with this tragedy. Uh, and I think it was a cause for reflection. Uh, and while we were in the White House at the time, I said uh, that we're going to have to mobilize all the agencies of the federal government, but also work with partners on the ground around the country uh, to start coming up with solutions uh, to address systemic racism and what happens uh, in particular to our young men of color, but as we extended it further, uh, people of color in every walk of life. Uh, over those seven years, we have seen enormous uh, responses from communities and cities and organizations all across the country. Uh, we have seen uh, people come together 
to, to not just talk about the problem, but try to come up with concrete solutions and implement those solutions. Uh, and what I have consistently drawn inspiration from is to see how uh, the process hasn't been static, but it has continually evolved with people learning from what works, what doesn't work, pushing the envelopes of what is possible and challenging all of us to see how we can do better. Uh, and all that work uh, is making a difference on the ground, but it's also uh, a reflection of the fact that uh, it hasn't solved the problem. Uh, we are uh, here in part to commemorate uh, the anniversary of one of the most heartbreaking and vivid reminders of uh, the injustices that are occurring in this country every single day in sometimes uh, ways that don't attract attention uh, and don't get highlighted, but uh, that have touched uh, the lives of so many. Uh, you know, when George Floyd was murdered uh, and we witnessed it on phones and televisions and screens and images, uh, you know, it was just the most vivid reminder that uh, the criminal justice system in this country has never operated in a colorblind fashion uh, and that uh, the consequences for families uh, and communities uh, has been uh, devastating. And uh, when I saw the mobilization primarily led by young people over the last year, uh, it gave me hope. Uh, and what's given me even more hope is the way in which uh, it wasn't a one-off, but that hope has now been translated into action. Uh, and so part of our goal here today is to bring together some of the folks who on the ground are reimagining what public safety looks like, uh, rebuilding communities, challenging uh, the status quo, uh, using all the tools and toolkit to bring about systemic change. Uh, we wanna hear from them what lessons they've learned, what barriers they're still confronting, uh, and to find out how we can support each other uh, in making more progress uh, as the years goes uh, as the years go on. So uh, with that, I just wanna thank the amazing panel that we've put together. I know this is gonna be structured in two parts and uh, Michael Spitt, our, our director of uh, My Brother's Keeper, uh, is going to be uh, making sure that we're all moving in in, uh, in a disciplined way and that uh, uh, I, in particular, don't talk too long. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Michael and uh, uh, you can start off the conversation. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and good afternoon, everyone. As the president said, I'm Michael Smith. And I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the My Brother's Keeper Alliance. President Obama launched the My Brothers Keeper Alliance in 2014 to address the persistent opportunity gaps that boys and young men of color face and to ensure that all young people can reach their full potential. Today, My Brothers Keeper Alliance supports a network of hundreds of community coalitions nationwide that are working to reduce barriers and expand opportunities for our boys and young men and their families. So thank you for joining us for this critical conversation today at this pivotal moment in our nation's history. For the first portion of our time together, we will explore with President Obama, Alicia Garza, and Mayor Ras Baraka what it means to turn anguish into action, what it looks like to ensure this moment sparked by tragedy turns into a movement that change, changes lives. So let's get started with the renowned founder of Black Features Lab and co-creator of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter Global Network, Alicia Garza. Um, Alicia, we've seen the data that shows the protest movement following the tragic murder of George Floyd a year, a year ago was the largest in modern history. Uh, we also saw a report in the New York Times this week that noted, whereas support for Black Lives Matter remains relatively high among racial and ethnic minorities, support among white Americans has proved both fickle and volatile. So Alicia, the, Alicia, the question for you is, what was different about this unprecedented moment and are the unprecedented protests that we saw actually leading to unprecedented reforms? Hmm. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Michael. These are important questions to ask. And I wanna start off by maybe reframing the question a little bit, because I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, these moments are not 
disparate moments. They are certainly connected. And over the last decade in particular, uh, what we have seen is the growing and expansion and entrenchment of a movement that has not just changed this country, but has changed this world. And I remember, Michael, in 2013, when we came out with Black Lives Matter, people would call me on the phone and say, well, why can't you just say all lives matter or Black Lives Matter too, right? There was a big push to get us to soften it up. But we really wanted to make sure that we said what we meant and that we meant what we said. And as a result, Michael, I think what we're seeing here is that you know, Black Lives Matter, not just the organization, but the movement and the idea, right, that Black people deserve to live full and dignified lives, just like everybody else in this country and around the world deserves to have. It is not just entrenched now in our culture, but it is becoming a policy debate that is long overdue. I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that in this last summer, the reason that we saw this re-explosion of this movement is because of the organizing work that so many incredible people have been doing across the nation. From elected officials to community-based organizations, what we have seen is that in between protests, people are taking uh, the initiative to change culture, to create the fertile soil from which rich, bold policies come from. And then we have also been working inside uh, legislative houses to make sure that we're not just talking about Black Lives Mattering in, in symbol, but that we are giving substance to what it means to make Black Lives Matter from City Hall to Congress. Alicia, thank you so much for that answer. Let's bring in uh, the mayor of the great city of Newark, New Jersey, one of the first mayors to take the My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge back in 2014. Uh, Mr. Mayor, same question for you. Uh, was this a moment or a movement? And I would love to hear what you would say to Alicia's question, uh, which, you know, how in Newark are you not just saying Black Lives Matter, but how are you showing that Black Lives Matter in a lasting way? So I would have to echo, first, I want to thank you for allowing me to be on the panel. Good to see President Obama and still doing the work and uh, Alicia for the great work you're doing and have been doing. I would have to echo her sentiment that it is a movement and, and uh, a lot of folks are saying, that because of the death of George Floyd, all of this happened. And George Floyd's death was tragic. It's not the first uh, and unfortunately may not be the last and it's not the only one that we saw on video. Uh, so it have, you have to factor in all of the organizing that was going on, the, the power of the Black Lives Matter movement, all of the folks and the voices that were involved in that. And as was said, all of the work that's happening in cities uh, like Newark, we were under consent decree uh, when I first took office. Uh, thanks to the Justice Department and uh, President Obama's Justice Department. And, um, you know, it was a good thing for our city. And we began to push, push, push to begin putting reforms in place in our police department immediately. Uh, and I think those reforms began to pay off. Uh, we, we started hiring social workers with police money before people start saying defund the police. We, we started doing those things. But I think what's important is that the moment in this kind of accelerated the kind of work that we were doing and work that other folks like us are doing all over the country. So it gave us the cover fire, if you will, to begin to create uh, uh, bigger and broader opportunities and do things we were trying to do for years. It gave us the, the room to get this stuff done. All of the, the protesting, the talk, the discussion made us do this right now front and center and gave us the support to make it happen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I could just ask a quick follow-up question. We saw some impressive headlines coming out of Newark uh, that showed there were zero shots fired uh, by officers in the city of Newark last year. Can you tell us a little bit more about that headline and how you actually got there? By God's grace, brother. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work uh, that's been happening on the ground. I think, uh, one, we've changed the complexion of the department. It, it resembles the people who live in the city. Uh, that happened over four or five years. Uh, a lot of the uh, folks from in the department now uh, have families and residents uh, in the city or live here themselves. I think all of the policy and changes that we've been making uh, because of the consent decree in conjunction with the community has also, has, has also helped as well. De-escalation, use of force, all of these things have been incredibly helpful. Uh, and just working with the community uh, with Equal Justice USA and having trauma circles, police and community together, uh, as well as uh, alternative uh, opportunities to stop violence and crime or reduce violence and crime, making sure the police are a part of a larger public safety strategy as opposed to the only public safety strategy. I think all of those things worked out 
so I, I just think it was a perfect storm. Uh, and we experienced this stuff without even, you know, uh, paying real attention to it. Uh, and it doesn't mean we don't have any uh, mistakes or, or problems. In fact, the following year, the first, as soon as we opened up the year, we had a police shooting and prayerfully it'll be the only one. But uh, we, we are continuing to get better because we're working together collaboratively to make sure we reimagine what public safety looks like. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, let's bring President Obama back into this conversation. You talked about it being a per perfect storm, but you also talk about this work happening over years. Alicia, when we were talking in advance, you, I think you wanted to ask the president a question about the evolution of the movement. Let me let me turn it over to you and not parse your words. Indeed. Thank you, Michael, and greetings, Mr. President. I wanted to ask you, you know, clearly this iteration of this movement that is generations long, but this iteration certainly did emerge under your presidency, and you certainly had both the uh, the privilege and the challenge, right, of being an authority figure uh, during this during this moment, and really being a, a, a decisive uh, decision maker around how some of these uh, policies move forward. I wanted to ask you, Mr. President, given that, how has your thinking changed uh, as you've seen the evolution of this movement over the last decade, or has it? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you're seeing this movement evolve and uh, where you think we still have left to go? Well, it, it's a great question, Alicia. And, you know, uh, part of the lens I look at it from is this happened when I was president, but I started as a community organizer, right? And I'd kind of gone through the phases. I'd been a state uh, community organizer, uh, a state legislator, a federal legislator, and then president. So um, what it meant was that even while I was in the Oval Office, I was viewing it, I think, through different prisms. Uh, part of me was uh, wildly enthusiastic just to see this resurgence of activism uh, because uh, you know, as I've written before, uh, my inspiration, my vision of politics and government has always been, it starts from the bottom up, not from the top down. A every bit of progress we've made, starting with the abolition movement, uh, through women's suffrage, through the union movement, through, uh, you know, the, the modern civil rights movement, uh, politicians typically followed rather than led in terms of uh, big progress. Um, and, you know, at the same time, there were some frustrations for me in my institutional role. So for example, uh, I went as far as I could just commenting on cases like Trayvon Martin or what was happening in Ferguson because, uh, as we discovered, not every president follows this, uh, at least my successor didn't, but I followed the, the basic notion that uh, the Justice Department was independent. I could not steer them, and I wanted Eric Holder and the Civil Rights Division, the Justice Department. Uh, I did not in any way want to endanger their capacity to go in, investigate, and potentially charge perpetrators, which meant that I could not uh, come down or appear to come down uh, decisively in terms of guilt or innocence in terms of what happened. So you had institutional constraints. Um, but what I'm proud of is that not only were we able to uh, refashion how the Justice Department thought about these issues, uh, coming in, looking at a jurisdiction like Ferguson and saying, how do we use all the tools of the federal government to re think what they're doing and to hold them accountable. Uh, but also to be able to use our convening power uh, to gather and focus attention on what are the practical outcomes that can be implemented across the country. Um, if, if, I, if you ask me what are the things I wish I might have done better or more effectively, the thing that I, I, I 
constantly struggled with was how could I get the passion and uh, concern that had been focused in with Trayvon and Ferguson and uh, the subsequent events, uh, how could I help people make the link between uh, those events and political power and action, not just at the federal level, but mo even more importantly at the state and local levels where the vast majority of criminal law and policing decisions are made. Because um, keep in mind in 2012, I won, but I didn't win Congress back. Uh, and we didn't uh, win a bunch of governorships back and we didn't win a bunch of state legislatures back. And so all the reform initiatives that we were coming up with and the ideas that had been generated, we weren't able to translate into as bold a set of initiatives as I would want it because we just couldn't get it through a, a, a legislature that was opposed, both at the federal and in many state and, and, and municipal jurisdictions. So when I when you ask me what I think has evolved, that I am greatly uh, hopeful about, it is the way in which what you described as that sustained uh, mobilization and institutionalization of the movement has now uh, has for several years now been refocusing on, all right, how do we get a new district attorney in there? And when we do, how do we make sure that they're held accountable? How do we uh, start electing state legislatures uh, that are rethinking uh, what we're criminalizing and what we're not? How do we uh, analyze budgets and make very clear decisions about how money's spent? And who exactly is negotiating with uh, the police officers union uh, to determine what the basic guidelines are in terms of how they are or are not held accountable. All that granular work that's being done at the local level uh, is exactly where I would have wanted to see us move. And, uh, and, and it's a credit uh, to you and other activists who have been keeping that sustained focus and translating it into concrete goals, aims, policies, initiatives, uh, that ultimately is going to make a difference. Because the same was true in, you know, some people are calling this now the, the third reconstruction and the civil rights movement in the 60s, the second reconstruction. Well, the same thing, had, you know, folks didn't just suddenly, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson didn't suddenly just one day say, we shall overcome and I'm going to sign a civil rights bill, right? You had seen 10, 15 years of work uh, so that as the movement got higher profile, there was also uh, an entire infrastructure there ready to translate that uh, into change uh, that resulted in the Civil Rights Act and, and the Voting Rights Act. And I'm seeing some of that same work being done. The, bigger, the biggest challenge, I think, with uh, this area is that you're dealing with a much more decentralized uh, uh, Bohemia, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, uh, you know, counties and, and local districts and municipalities and trying to uh, work at a national level. And as you alluded to a, a global level, because some of these issues are global, uh, while at the same time recognizing, all right, real change is going to happen if we change that structure in that city or in that county or in that uh, police board um, you know that that i think is uh is our biggest challenge thank you mr president let's let's turn the tables a little bit you're used to folks asking you questions all the time i think you have some questions for alicia and mayor baraka i'm really interested in this generational um combination that we have here so mr president uh, questions for them i think michael's implication is that i'm old <laughs> uh, Never. But, uh, you know, I think I'll ask the same question of both of you, uh, and 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 that is, uh, how can 
uh, we be most supportive, based on your experience, of what young organizers are doing um, and maintain an effective dialogue. Uh, you know, one, one of the, the um, most powerful moments uh, in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder last summer was uh, me having the opportunity to have John Lewis uh, shortly before his death uh, with a panel of uh, young uh, activists uh, from across the country and, and just uh, seeing uh, that interaction. But I think so often there are lessons learned but oftentimes we don't have a chance for our elders to transmit ideas to and suggestions to young people, but also conversely, young people explaining, all right, you know what, uh, we appreciate what you've done, but uh, you know, we, we gotta, we're not satisfied, we, we're, we're pushing further. Um, so, so what are some of the ways in which uh, myself, uh, Mayor Barack, uh, others, can be most supportive of activists on the ground. Uh, that's question number one. And, and, and question number two, uh, and, and this may be, may be more directed uh, towards the mayor, um, we're trying to reimagine public safety. At the same time, we also recognize that uh, in many ways, the reason that police community relations are so fraught is because the communities themselves are subject to all kinds of systemic discrimination, lack of jobs, lack, lack of opportunity, and so forth. Um, and as a consequence, there is violence that is real in many of our communities. How are you balancing when you have a dialogue with constituents? Listen, we need to reimagine police, and they may be worried, okay, yes, but I, it, right now I've got concerns about violence not just from the police, but also uh, in our communities uh, that we recognize as part of a, a tragic legacy, but I also have to worry about that if I'm a, you know, uh, my kids walking home from school. How are we talking about that in a way that's effective and brings uh, folks together? Thank you, Mr. President. Alicia, why don't you start and uh, we'll, we'll do short answers if you don't mind. Start with the president's questions about uh, the role that, that uh, he and others can play to support activists, and then we'll come to you, Mayor Baraka, to close. Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll try to keep it quick. I mean, I think our strength here, uh, Mr. President, is that we have been building across generations. And so we're committed not to keep making the same old mistakes, but to be courageous enough together to innovate and experiment with the solutions that we need to move forward. And I'm so proud of the work uh, that Mayor Baraka is doing. I also wanna lift up the work happening in Ithaca, New York uh, around reimagining public safety and actually having more civilian control over that. Uh, that's a partnership with the Center for Policing Equity that is doing incredible work to reimagine what it looks like in our communities to be safe by investing in our communities. And the BREATHE Act as well, which I think does that very nicely. I think the highlights of, of what we need to do to keep supporting each other is to remind each other to be courageous. You know, President Obama, I heard earlier, I said earlier that, you know, when we started Black Lives Matter, people told us to tone it down, and I'm so glad we did not. And now we're having a conversation about how we fund policing and what policing actually does. And the fact of the matter is policing doesn't stop crime. Uh, policing responds to crime. But before that response, there are all kinds of things happening in our communities that are incorrigible. And then we're asking people to essentially uh, 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 deal better with not having the things that they need to live well. And we're asking each other, well, why are people hurting each other? And it's because we don't have the infrastructure we need. And that has been an intentional uh, program and project for at least the last 30 years. But I think people in my mom's generation and even in my grandma's generation could tell you that's actually been a generations long project. I'll also say that one of the things that we can do together to keep supporting each other uh, is to remind ourselves, right, that um, we need culture and we need policy. And so often, right, we are focused, as we should be, 
on changing the rules that have been rigged against our communities for a long time. That is necessary. But in order for us to get there, we also have to invest in the ways in which we understand right and wrong, good and bad, who belongs and who does not. And I think this movement has done an incredible job of doing both, creating that fertile cultural soil for new and bigger and more innovative conversations to happen. So thank you for the question and I'll turn it over to Mayor Baraka. Thank you. Um, we are actually dealing with this issue right now, Mr. President. Uh, we created an Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery, trying to treat violence as a public health issue. We're closing, actu we're actually closing down one of the precincts and turning it into an office of violence prevention and trauma recovery there uh, to kind of expand what public safety looks like. So the people in that community obviously are a little up in arms because they're concerned about us closing the precinct because they want to make sure they still have police in their community. When I go to community meetings, if the people people ask me, uh, where are the police? Because when they don't see police, they think that there is no safety. Our community equates safety with police. In suburban communities, if a police officer is on your block, people say, well, what are the police doing here? Is something wrong? Because they understand that public safety is more than just cops. Cops come when something goes wrong. We have to change what, what our viewpoint of uh, is of public safety. Uh, and, and get people to understand that there's more ways for us to reduce crime and violence without police. In fact, we've reduced crime in Newark and also reduced the number of arrests, which means there's no real causal relationship between arrest and a reduction of violence and crime. And, and so we have to get our people to understand that and see that in our communities and have faith that we have the power and the information to help reduce violence and crime in other ways besides over-policing communities. Mayor Baraka, Alicia, thank you so much uh, for your work, for this powerful conversation. Let's go ahead and move into the next part of the conversation with President Obama, uh, where he will be joined by leaders and young people from our MBK communities uh, to discuss how they are leading the way to reimagine public safety. Uh, these leaders represent organizations MBK Alliance invests in that are expanding evidence-based initiatives to reduce youth violence, grow effective mentorship programs, and measurably improve life outcomes for boys and young men of color and their families. So let's kick this conversation off with our young men, the motivation behind everything we do at MBK Alliance. Um, from the great state of California and LA County, MBK LA County, we have Jacob Black Jackson um, from Los Angeles Youth Uprising, otherwise known as Layup. Uh, and then from the hometown of the Obama Foundation, uh, we have uh, Chicago. We have Anthony Montoya, uh, who is the youth representative with New Life Centers of Chicagoland, a part of MBK Chicago. So Jacob and Anthony, I just want to know after this year of anguish and action, this unprecedented year we had, how are you doing? How are you and your families doing? And I'd also like to know how you got involved with your organization. So uh, Jacob, why don't we start with you? Black, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Black, there you go. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, well, me personally, um, I feel like, I don't know, I'm blessed to say every day, I live to see another one. Um, and I guess working this past year, um, uh, with you just coalition, brothers on sales coalition and LA Youth the Rising Coalition, uh, has been pretty stressful, you know. The way how I got into this work is when I I, I was I went to Crenshaw High School and I was pushed out and uh I had to find a school and what you call it, two because it's right down the street. I got into here and uh what you call it, they helped me graduate literally just last year. And you know. And I, and I found out like, you know, this organizing work has always impacted me since you feel me, my brother, he was shot and killed in uh, 1994 by the LAPD, 77 precinct. And uh, he was bled to death, you feel me? Um, and the police on scene didn't call ambulance. Um, and what you call it, like my mom, she watched my brother spend his last day before Christmas bleeding out on the street. And you feel me? I just felt like, uh, it's always been like, it's always been an impact to me because my mom, she's always been hyper vigilant with my safety. And so like, even right now, I have my family over, my friends over. And when we're walking down the street, I've always been stopped by police, you know, just been stopped by, um, um you know, just on random things. Like I just been harassed just for walking um, with a group or two or more that uh, identifies black or brown, you know? And I feel as if just like, I'm harassed on a daily or on any week given basis, you feel me? And I, I have to give out like these know your rights cards. It's um, 
everything you do when you've been stopped by police. Um, we launched this like 18 years ago. You feel me? And I keep this with me. And this is also my um, contact information, all that on the back of it, if needed, with the organization. And Black, and you, you give this away a part of the work that you do with Layup? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Layup, um, you just coalition, brothers and sales coalition. Any youth that I, I'm in contact with, I, I would like to give them my card, um, what to do. Tells you like to stay calm, don't talk, ask for a lawyer, be safe, say no to a search, and be aware of gang profiling. Um, which color? So yeah, I um, mean, it's very important to have this, you know, because literally just last night they pulled up on us, and I just told my cousin and my and my and my brother do not speak, ask for a lawyer, and you know they were just harassing us just last night, you know about oh where's the gun at where's this with the boo and we're just coming out to wash a truck, you know that's all we came out to do. And, and Black, you know, how I, do you think how do you think layup has really helped you um, when you think about where you were a couple of years ago and where you are now? Well, for for me, I feel as if like you know, layup gave me advantage to you know um, pull out like like any tactics that I don't know. You feel me against the police? Any know your rights that I don't know? You feel me? I I use it on them. You know, I don't speak to them. I just say like you know, can I see your serial ID? Um, what are your um, pulling me over for? I also take the identification card and then you feel me, I make a, a what you call it, an incident, incident report on me. So yeah, I also felt like, what you call it, you know, I'm involved with more organizations that do this work and pushing for like, um, you know, spaces like, the space that I'm in right now is called Chuka's Justice Center. You know, it helps with like peace building, transforming the justice, which peace building is like a thousand way of de-escalation tactics. Um, you know, without using oppressive tools, um, you know, and being able to connect with the community, helping the community in any type of way, whether it be food, safety, you know, um, just any type of way. Beautiful. Uh, uh, That's beautiful, uh, Black. I, thank you so, thank you so much, brother, for telling us about that. Uh, what's your no brother's problem. name, Black? That passed uh, away. His name is uh, Willis Poe Jackson. Uh, yeah, W I L L A S. Po, B, we we P remember e. Willis. We speak we speak Willis's name. Thank you for being with us, Black Anthony. Let's go over to you. Uh, tell us how are you doing after this unprecedented year and how you got involved uh, with New Life. Yeah, well, I'm gonna get started with how I got involved in New Life. I, I got involved in New Life through probation when I was 16 years old. Um, during that time, um, I thought that getting stopped by the police, you know, being outside and being a gang member was my life. I really believed that, and I had that mentality. Um, once I went into New Life, I I received a mentor and he helped me, you know, open my open my mind, you know, beyond the hood mentality. Um, and this year during George Floyd's death, there was a lot of civil unrest. And I took the opportunity because uh, I got laid off during the, the, the pandemic as well, you know, so I couldn't work. And I was I was out there with a mentor. I called him, you know, everybody's like looting the stores in my neighborhood. What should I do? He's like, oh, come over here. We're in Little Village. A lot of the guys in the neighborhood have organized themselves. On, on 26th Street and Little Village to uh, to prevent people from looting. So I went there and I, and I spoke with my mentors and I volunteered. And during that time, uh, I, I was able to talk and, uh, about my experiences to other people and hear how frustrated people are about what was going on in the world at the, at the time. Um, so during that time, I, I, I've been able to, you know, work with communities uh, or organizations and get hired at one of the community organizations and, you know, work Work with the mayor and the lieutenant governor to to create policy and and be there to create change in, in the criminal justice system especially in the juvenile criminal justice system because it all starts when you're young you know it, it doesn't happen you're not born a killer you're not born a criminal you you're you're made into one um so so that yeah that's my story right there thank you so much anthony thanks for being here let's go to the older young brothers that are in the room uh benny estrada from new life in chicagoland and julio marcial uh, from Liberty Hill Foundation, which helps coordinate the work of MBK LA County. Um, Benny, let's start with you. You all are on the front lines of changing the face of public safety. You've been doing it for years. Could you tell us a little bit more about the approach of New Life and the impact that you've had? Yeah, so at the core of what we do, we're a mentoring program, um, but we do we also do sports, education. Uh, I'm over the street outreach team. Uh, I've been working in the neighborhood for more than 20 years now in that capacity. And then we're also, we also uh, ramped up our food distribution uh, in the community. Um, and, you know, basically it's just like trying to figure out like what are the needs in the neighborhood and then how we can, you know, stand in the gaps and, and provide what it is that the neighborhood's lacking. Um, 
with the street outreach work, it really is about having relationships in the neighborhood. Uh, the I would say the 95 to 95 percent of our team is from the neighborhood, knows the community, have been born and raised. Um, and I think it, you know, it's it it gives us the advantage when it go when it when it comes to dealing with you know violence in the neighborhood, knowing knowing who's involved and knowing you know how we can intervene in certain situations. Thank you so much, Benny. Um, and let's go to Julio. What the reason we brought both of y'all here together today is because the work that New Life does is on the ground. They show up, you know, at some of the worst times in the lives of a family when someone has been shot. A uh, New Life shows up to to help interrupt that violence. Um, they are working with food services, providing the needs that the families have today. Julio, the work that you're doing is looking more at systems. You're looking at policy change uh, to make sure that we have fewer of those incidents going forward. So tell us a little bit more about the MBK LA County Coalition and the work that you're, you're doing and the impact you've had. Yeah, thank you, Michael. So, you know, we believe unapologetically about supporting frontline youth organizing uh, to build power. And so this is about collective power. You know, when we started on this path, we knew LA County was number one for all the wrong reasons. We arrest, prosecute, incarcerate more black, brown, Native American youth than any jurisdiction in this country. And we wanted to change that. And the way we wanted to change that was to support power building organizations that were working with young people who were directly impacted. You heard from Black. Black is one of a hundred other young people who have been centered in this process and really to be able to lift up their own personal stories. We talk about often uh, policy development, implementation, um, and transformation. We're not interested in reforming anything that's broken here in LA County. And what we've seen is that when you really understand the impact of youth organizing that has had on this movement at large, it means engaging and centering young people in everything that we do, right? It really means encouraging them and supporting them as full partners and leaders in this work. And we put their voices and demands at the center of every campaign that we've done. And this has led to historic work with, again, where youth organizers have moved key stakeholders to move from allies to freedom fighters. The young people understand that change starts two steps past where you're comfortable. Uh, Black mentioned, and I'll give you one success story is that you know, five years ago, we developed a, a new division of youth diversion and development. Why? We were in, we were arresting 10,000 young people every year in Los Angeles County. 80% of those young people were eligible to be diverted to a community-based organization that could offer them support, healing, education, a job. Instead, what LA County was doing was harming um, these young people. And so these young people, these organizations that we support, it is truly about building collective power to, tr to transform the institutional structures that have harmed communities of color in LA County for far too long. Well, extraordinary work. I, you know, I, I, when we get those updates all the time to see the coalitions that you're building, and I know that doesn't come easy, uh, but it, it's really paying off uh, in, in big ways. I know President Obama is anxious to get into this conversation, so I'm going to let Black ask President Obama a question. Black, when we were talking before, you had a question about community organizing that I think really fits uh, with this moment. So Black, let me turn it over to you to ask uh, the president a question. All right, so, all right, my question is gonna be, um, as a fellow community organizer, what do you say to the current group of youth organizers like me who are fighting for justice and peace, yet getting pulled over by police on a weekly basis? Um, how did you manage those conflicts when you were an organizer? Well, look, first of all, if, if you're getting pulled over on a weekly basis, then I'm glad that you're passing out those cards and you know that that uh you know one thing that i think would be useful would be to just start uh recording and, and gathering information about this so that uh that can translate into holding folks accountable um because you know wherever you live uh there are you know council members and you know officials who are supposed to be accountable to you and other fellow citizens if you're minding your own business not to be harassed uh, so th so that'd be my first bit of advice um you know black i think more broadly uh you're on the right track uh and uh the degree to which you can find like-minded people to work with so you don't feel alone in this work uh, i think is really important um, you know, my experience when I was a little bit older than you and, and I was working in communities is sometimes you feel as if you're not making a difference because uh, the, the problems seem overwhelming and you feel as if 
man, I'm out here and I'm just trying to, uh, you know, do my part. Uh, and sometimes what I'm doing doesn't seem to be making a difference. But, you know, I was in Chicago, like Anthony, and, and, and over time, as I started meeting other organizers, I was organizing on the South Side, but there were folks in Pilsen Little Village who were working in, in, in the predominantly Latino community. And then I find out that on the West Side, there are a bunch of organizations that are doing work. And on the North Side, and, and, and suddenly now it starts looking more like a citywide movement. People start sharing experiences. People start imagining, all right, how can we put together campaigns that bring our collective voices and power to bear? Uh, that ends up being very powerful. So, um, you know, take the time, even as you're doing the work, to make sure that you are reaching out and learning from and in communications with and connecting with others who are doing the work. Uh, because we can't, none of us can do this alone. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I was I, when we were talking uh, earlier with uh, uh, Alicia Garza. One, one of the, and she asked me, sort of, how have I been reflecting on the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the movement to to reimagine public safety? One thing that I wanted to say, but Michael, you know, I could tell I was running out of time and I was taking too long, so I, I sped up, but. One great lesson I think that we've seen over the last 10 years is this movement has not been dependent on a single charismatic leader, but has been a collective leadership, right? Like you don't have one person who's just made out there making speeches all the time, or you know, is considered the, the head spokesperson for everything. And that's powerful when you've got a collective leadership of people who are in communities in the on the ground, doing things, working together, collaborating. Sometimes this person's taking the lead. Sometimes this other person's taking the lead. Sometimes this organization has come up with the right answer. They're sharing those what worked, you know, to other folks around the country. Uh, you know, it's a lot harder to dismantle uh, momentum for movement when. You know, you've got a whole bunch of people all at once who are in communications and coordinating and working together. Uh, it's not dependent on one person. Uh, and, and that I think is uh, is really important. And it's a good lesson uh, for uh, you and, and other young organizers who are out there. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm gonna let you keep going. Uh, do you have any questions for either the, the young men or the slightly older men that we have gathered here today? <laughs> they all look young to me. Uh, but, but listen, uh, you know, I think, I think the main question that, I, that I've got is all of you are doing outstanding work. Uh, some of you are, are still so young that, you know, uh, you were essentially getting mentored and helped. And then now, you know, you're trying to give back, uh, others of you like Benny and Julio, you guys have been at this a little bit longer. Um, what is it that you think um, more than anything prevents you from expanding the good work that's being done? Uh, so, you know, if, if, if suddenly, you know, I was the mayor of LA uh, for a day and I said, all right, I, I, I got my checkbook out and I'm, you know, ready to go and I've got, you know, community support. So, what is it that you need? Um, you know, how would you answer that? Because some of these, for example, diversion programs, we know uh, are important. Thinking, rethinking how uh, we deal with probation, right? Which right now is not designed necessarily for folks who are re-entering uh, you know, society to succeed. It's you know, it's almost like it's designed to. Uh, constrain further punish, but not thrive. Um, you know, uh, what would be sort of the two or three items that you would say, man, if, if we really focused on this, then I know we could start seeing impact on scale as opposed to just seeing, you know, some success, but it's still overwhelmed by the overall system. And, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, 
Uh, Julio, and, and you guys can just kind of go through, uh, uh, each take a crack at that question uh, in the time we've got remaining. Thank you for that each question. Of you gets, each of you gets one thing. Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Mr. President. I, you know, I think that's a, you know, it's a great point because right now we're in the implementation phase where the community in a community led process has literally mapped out a roadmap to really determine how to develop a very comprehensive alternative to incarceration work plan. We have created and the community has created how to reimagine youth justice. Like they have done the work. What I would suggest at this point, especially for decision makers, our board of supervisors and other key, sold, key stakeholders in government is don't declare victory and send everybody home, right? Make sure that community partners can be at the table as the policy goes into the, into the bureaucracy, welcome them into the guts of the system, advocate for them and hold the departments and agencies accountable to them and us and ourselves accountable to the community for those results. That's what we're having um, a challenge. We have the public will, we have political will, we have uh, uh, all the ingredients, but we're still stuck in that bureaucracy of implementation where we're still trying to figure out how to pay for it when we know what the plan is. Good. Betty? You know, President, I would say, you know, investing in investing our, in, in our communities, I think is, is key. Um, when we talk about things like mental health services in our neighborhood and how scarce they are, and the years of trauma that our, our families have gone through with, with being victims of violence or, you know, not having food on the table and how that affects your mentality. I think uh, that, I think investing in our neighborhoods and then also, you know, looking at programs that, you know, are actually doing the work on the ground in the neighborhood that are investing in the neighborhood themselves, I think is also something that, you know, I think our city in Chicago has gotten good at but not great at it. We look at it in terms of how much the city of Chicago is investing into, you know, the Office of Violence Prevention as opposed to places like Los Angeles or New York. I think we're on the right track, but we need to get way better at it. Good. Andy? Uh, I would say I'm, I'm part of a couple of groups uh, that create policy, and in some of those groups, uh, what they call community is one person that has experienced those experiences and then you have two community leaders and the rest of people that are working uh, professionally that have never experienced or aren't from that community. So I would uh, recommend uh, having more diversity and people from the community themselves. Right. Black, you, you get uh, you get the, the last answer, man. If, if I can, well, I was just gonna say, echo everything that they said and just hire young people for the kinds of jobs that we wanna do, community work, entrepreneurship and arts opportunities, all of that. That's it. Fantastic. See, we, we got it in under the wire. <laughs> That's amazing. I think that wraps up for conversation, Mr. President. I would love to give you an opportunity to provide some closing remarks and, and set us off. Well, look, uh, uh, for all, everybody who's been listening, obviously we've got uh, uh, these amazing panelists, uh, uh, the, the, the folks that, that we uh, highlighted today, but uh, as, as you can testify to, Michael, um, this is just a cross section of all kinds of great work across the country that we haven't even touched on. And so there are a whole host of resources, uh, documents, presentations, ideas, data, uh, you know, an entire resource bank that, uh, the MBK Collective has been able to uh, put together. And part of our goal here is to make sure that, uh, you know, once anybody who's participating, uh, once you've been enlightened, inspired, you know, you hear some of these dynamic uh, young people talking and you say, man, I, I, I want to support that. Uh, the key is now follow up. And you know, and, and we also have some, as Julio put it, uh, he, uh, you can either call them decision makers or bureaucrats or what, whatever the phrase you want to use is. Um, uh, you need to avail yourselves of these resources and take action. And each of us can take action in some modest way to help move the boulder up the hill uh, to get to the place where we're all seeking to go. Uh, and that, that is uh, a country and communities where people are healthy, uh, people have resources, uh, that for the most part, they are self-policing as uh, you know, Mayor Baraka said, if you're living in a nice neighborhood, 
you know, it's rare where the police show up. Uh, and that's the reason is because the community is healthy and functioning on an ongoing basis. Uh, it, it's not uh, requiring constant intervention in order to just uh, maintain safety or order. It, people are living their lives in, in, in uh, healthy uh, and, and constructive ways. And, and so uh, I, I would just urge that uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, that everybody, I, I know there's going to be other uh, work that's being done during this conference, but I want to make sure that uh, everybody takes something away from this that they can act on, uh, that this isn't just, you know, you feeling good just because, uh, you know, you tuned in uh, uh, to hear some remarks, uh, because ultimately this is not something that uh, is going to change overnight. You know, uh, everybody we've heard uh, talk to, uh, even somebody as young as Black, they've been at this for a while now, and and uh, it's oftentimes frustrating and lonely and uh you know, you're, you're, you're really uh, battling against forces that have built up over centuries. And, uh, and so all of us have a, have a role to play, a part to play. And Michael, I know that you will highlight uh, how everybody can access uh, some of the resources uh, that are available to help communities uh, continue to make the progress that we've been making. Thank you, Mr. President. I can't uh, say anything more than that other than thank our panelists. You can go to Obama.org uh, to find resources on how you can get involved. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Appreciate you guys.